Okay, everybody, welcome to Radical Anthropology. This evening we have a long-standing, very good friend of RAG, going back years, um, uh, and also, of course, a colleague of, of Camilla's at the University of East London, who has done many years of fieldwork um, in, in Nicaragua among the, uh, the mosquito. And those of you who have been familiar with RAG in the past, we are particularly interested in those rather few societies these days, which are both matrilocal um, and matrilineal. And I'm, I'm thrilled with the work I've seen of, um, of, of Marx already. Uh, and he's going to be telling us more about the um, Confederacy of Sisters. Um, so over to you, uh, Mark. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chris. Um, um, first thing I, I guess I'll do is I'll try and share the screen, my screen. I've got a slideshow for you, so also let's see if this works. Click me on it. Yeah. Right, can you see my screen, everyone? Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, it should be the um, first introductory slide, the Mosquito Confederacy of Sisters, um, Fusion, Vision and Conflict. So, um, my name's Mark Jameson. As Chris said, I teach uh, anthropology at uh, University of East London. Um, I've been doing fieldwork amongst uh, mosquito-speaking people in eastern Nicaragua now for um, 29 years, so that's a long time. Uh, and uh, I've done 13 periods, 13 um, periods of field work in Mosquito, two of them quite long term. So uh, most of which has been spent in a village called Cacabilla, not all of it, but most of it in a village called Cacabilla. And it's uh, Cacabilla, um, uh, which I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, okay. Uh, so I, I guess I'll start. So what I want to talk uh, in, uh, talk about in this um, uh, meeting is uh, matrilineal kinship and how um, the mosquito uh, uh, imagine um, matrilineal relatedness and uh, how the matrilineal relatedness informs uh, their actions and their ideas and I want to do that by uh, presenting if you like uh, both uh, in terms of uh, models of uh, matrilineal kinship but also uh, more specifically in terms of case histories in which I uh, discuss um, uh, different instances of um, uh, matrilineal descent and how uh, for some people, uh, for some uh, mosquito people um, uh, in different contexts it's worked well and in others it hasn't worked so well and so on. So that's what I'm going to be looking at in terms of uh, the case histories. Right, so first of all, what I'm going to do is a little bit of uh, background about um, uh, matrilineal descent. I want to talk to you a, a little bit about matrilineal descent. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, here we go. First slide. Um, now, matrilineal descent uh, is, uh, is the principle of reckoning descent through uh, the mother's line. This is not necessarily the same as uh, matriarchy, and in fact, in most instances, it's not the same as matriarchy. But what is important is that your uh, the, the group to which you belong, um, your lineage, your descent group, and in many societies, descent groups and lineages are an important organising principle. That's not the case of all groups by any means. That there are plenty of uh, groups to which descent is not really an organising principle, but um, for those groups in which it is, um, that matrilineal descent is one kind of descent. 
there are more peoples in the world that reckon um, descent patrilineally through um, uh, the father's line, but there are, as Chris said, um, some groups where descent is in some way more important, is more important through um, the mother's line. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. The first thing is I want to do is, um, uh, before I go on to descent, uh, uh, to talk about descent, is I'm going to be showing a few um, kinship diagrams, which are essentially like genealogies. So they're like a bit like family trees. I'm going to um, show you uh, one of these um, so that you know what they look like. Um, one of, any one of these, this one will do. So this is um, a, a matrilineal descent group. And um, it's like a genealogy insofar as that the, um, the lines that go down indicate that, so for example, Angelia is uh, the parent to all of these children here. Chavi, Kidasku, not Lucilla, but uh, because there's no line to her, but Mitty, Danto, uh, uh, Alicia and Clarissa. So these are all her um, Angelia's children. And um, in what anthropologists have this convention that a triangle is a male. So in this diagram, we're looking at a, at a male as being a triangle and a circle as being a woman. Now, um, descent groups and um, mosquito descent groups are no different in this respect, but in most societies around the world, whether they're patrilineal, uh, directing descent through the father's line or through the mother's line, they are uh, exogamous, means that you have to, you're supposed to marry someone from outside of your descent group, but outside, um, otherwise it's regarded as being incestuous, so you marry someone from outside your descent group. So we can see if we look at this uh, descent group here, we've got Kidasku, who is a member of the descent group, he's uh, Angelia's uh, son, you see there's Angelia, there's her children, he's a triangle, so it's her son, and his um, uh, spouse is Lucilla, because you can see she's female, she's a circle, and then their children, you see this uh, line here, marks their, um, uh, um, their offspring, if you like. Well, it marks that they are a conjugal union, that they're spouses. And this it leads to their offspring, which you've got a number of daughters here. These are all daughters. Now, so um, it's like a genealogy. What you have to remember is that circle is uh, woman and triangle is male. Um, the other thing which I've done, which is my own innovation to help you, but I've shown that those who are of the same um, matrilineal descent group are coloured in grey. So uh, Rocky, Leoncia, Angelia, Javi, Gidasco, Mitty, Danto, Alicia, Clarissa, they're all members of this descent group, the Kuka Rocky's descent group. Whereas all of the others, um, which are, are members of other descent groups. So this is imp important. So I've, I've produce this color coding to so that you'll know who's a member of um, whose descent group. So um, I'll talk a little bit, a bit more about that when we come to it. It doesn't matter too much if you don't follow the diagrams insofar as what's more important is that what these descent diagrams are there for is to provide a bit of help for who is who when I come to talk about particular stories about this group of people. But so if you listen closely, you won't need um, the diagrams, but they're there to help you in case. Okay, I'm going back now um, to uh, the beginning. Right, okay. So if we talk about um, unilineal descent, you can see here, and here's a kinship diagram, that the red is descent through the father's line. And um, on the other side, you see, this is matrilineal descent through the mother's line. You see, these are circles and its descent is passed on um, uh, through the mother's line. So you typically, you wouldn't necessarily find that emphasized in the same different, in the same society, but that's just an example. That diagram just shows the difference between the two, if you like, in a diagrammatic form. So um, one thing about um, uh, um, descent is that you've, one of the most important parts, kinds of descent is unilineal descent. That is descent through either the mother's line or the father's line. It's not the only form of descent. So for example, in um, Europe, we reckon, tend to recognize, in modern Europe, we tend to recognize descent, what they call cognatically, which is through the mother and through the father. So um, descent through uh, both parents is important. That is not unilineal descent because in a unilineal society with unilineal descent, it's uh, descent through one line, either the mother's or the father's, which is important. 
The other thing that's interesting about unilineal descent is that what it does is it produces nicely demarcated groups. So when you're in a descent group, um, you know um, that people are either in your descent group or they're not in it. There's not an ambiguity that says, well, um, such and such a person, well, is my cousin, but is he a member of my descent group or people on the other side? You see that in unilineal descent, that this produces um, uh, nicely uh, demarcated groups. And this is why it's been quite interesting for anthropologists because unilineal descent groups uh, provide, if you like, uh, entities that can be, uh, if you like, corporate groups and they, they uh, are action groups where the members of one descent group, one unilineal descent group, uh, if you like, can act as a single entity. They can represent themselves as a single entity. So they were first described um, in the anthropological um, literature um, by um, an anthropologist called Evans Pritchard for a people um, called the Nua. I mean, they had just been described by other anthropologists before, but he first examined them for one particular society by looking at the Nua in his book, The Nua, which came out in 1940. And what Evans Pritchard showed was that Nua kinship, the Nua were a people of Southern Sudan, and that they were organized uh, around patrilineal descent. So this is, if you look at the diagram, that this, you can see how um, that the, all of those people, they're all descendants of a common ancestor, which is that uh, apical figure at the top, and they're all, therefore all members of, um, if you like, this large uh, patrilineage. And within that patrilineage, um, you find smaller lineages, which are, if you like, um, segments of those lineages or uh, segments, um, which, and within that segments, you find even smaller segments. So if you like, you have a lineage which is composed of uh, lineage segments. So, which are, so it's like, if you like, uh, Russian dolls. Uh, and these lineal, um, uh, these, uh, sorry, these uh, segments, if you like, are what organize political processes. So the Nua had this idea, according to Evans Pritchard, of these lineage segments um, uh, comprising groups of people who are allied to one another. They reckoned descent from the same ancestor, therefore they're, they're allies. And um, when they get into disputes with enemies, all of the people of that descent group can reckon themselves as being allies in a particular dispute. Now, if we find that there's a dispute uh, between members of the same uh, lineage, uh, for example, um, somebody within uh, the larger group um, A and someone within the larger group B, then someone in A can rely on all the people in uh, lineage A to support him, whereas those in uh, group B can rely on uh, each other to support them. So what it is, is that political processes are centered on newer ideas about alliance and confrontation between descent groups depending on genealogical closeness. Yeah, and if you see that the slide um, is going from green now uh, to yellow um, to blue and then uh, to pink, that those are the descent group at different levels of inclusiveness and depending on who your dispute is with, um, you would rely on uh, people within one of those segments to help you. And Evans Pritchard talked about the idea that you have um, lineage fusion, so group members of the same descent group will come together in some contexts against uh, common enemies, whereas in other contexts when members of the same descent group or a larger descent group are in confrontation with one another, that there'll be fission between the descent groups. So you might have a small segment uh, of the, uh, in opposition to another small segment within the same descent group. So what Evans Pritchard was trying to show was that uh, political processes uh, within the, for the newer work through principles of fission and fusion, depending on context. Now, for matrilineal descent, uh, anthropologists argued that it wasn't quite so easy. They were careful to note, most anthropologists noted that by and large in matrilineally organized uh, peoples, that um, they weren't matriarchies and that, uh, as one anthropologist famously, famously put it, that in matrilineal uh, societies, that men still made up um, the board of um, directors and that the important actors within a matrilineal society or the way that things like uh, uh, political leadership or property or office, all of those things that they were, the way that they were devolved was uh, not from mother to daughter to daughter's daughter and so on, 
but really the importance of people who held office, who held property, were uh, men, and that that, that would um, that property and office would evolve from mother's brother to sister's son, and another mother's brother to sister's son. So if you look here, there's an individual uh, a, a male, and uh, here, and he passes on his descent uh, to his uh, to sister to his sister's son. So um, uh, descent is. Uh, Keep in mind also that these descent groups are exogamy. Now, the problem with matrilineal descent groups, where this was uh, the case, is that um, that they didn't. Anthropologists argued that they were, didn't have very much longevity. Like you could look at these descent groups for the newer, and they could keep going and splitting over time. And because uh, generally, that after marriage, that men. Uh, that women would live uh, with their uh, spouses, with their husbands, that what would happen is that these patrilineal descent groups would stay more or less in the same place and that the, these descent groups would get larger and larger, but perhaps uh, segment if they got into conflicts with one another into smaller groups, but by, by and large, that potentially that they were quite uh, long, uh, they could have quite long lives, these patrilineal descent groups. With matrilineal descent groups, the problem uh, that they weren't, that what happened is that uh, father's brother and sister son, through whom descent was passed, would be separated by marriage in so far as that, uh, that if the society was generally matrilocal, in other words, that uh, men married in uh, from outside from another community into their wife's descent group, then what would happen is that the son uh, would then uh, move, have to move out to his spouse's uh, community and so forth. So you have this problem of uh, that, although there was matrilineal descent amongst men, that the problem was that this really couldn't be passed on very easily because they'd be separated by geography. Well, I'm arguing here that the matrilineal puzzle isn't necessarily a problem because in some societies it's not necessarily the case that men do constitute the board of directors. And what one finds, for example, amongst the mosquito is that it's really that political processes uh, to a considerable extent are organised amongst women and therefore the idea that um, the important uh, line of descent in matrilineal societies is uh, mother's brother to sister son isn't necessarily uh, terribly really important because uh, descent might be politically important from mother to daughter and then from uh, uh, daughter to daughter's daughter and so on. So what we find in what we might find amongst the mosquito and other societies is women um, are important political actors who um, are capable of shaping and breaking alliances with other groups of similarly constituted women. And this is where uh, in societies of that kind that would normally find that residence after marriage where husband and wife go to live is normally matrilocal. So normally um, that uh, you find that the groom will go and live with his bride in close to or with the bride's parents. So in other words, that men move out of their own communities and move in with their bride and that uh, descent is passed down from mother to daughter and so on. So it's like in that case, if as long as we assume that women can actually uh, constitute important political actors, that we can have something which is a bit like a, a, a female version of Evans Pritchard's model. And for women, if you imagine all those triangles there on this diagram here as uh, circles, uh, in other words, as women, that you could see this processes of a women, uh, if you like, controlling much of what constitutes politics and that you have these principles of alliance between matrilineally related women and sometimes um, a fusion where they get together matrilineally related women against other groups and sometimes uh, the fusion that is and sometimes fission where groups will split for uh, one reason or another and come to constitute themselves as perhaps as enemies or as perhaps less closely allied than they had been and so on. So these are the principles of fission and fusion are essentially about alliance. So um, the criticisms of Evans Pritchard's um, notions of lineage segmentation, as it was called, is that with Evans Pritchard, it obviously represents an androcentric, in other words, a male centric view of political processes. And even when applied to lineage ide ideas about descent to matrilineal societies, we're still looking at men as the board of directors. Is that necessarily always the case? 
I'm contesting that here. Uh, some critics uh, also noted um, that this Evans Pritchard model was very much an abstract, static model, of some, a model produced by anthropologists uh, to uh, look at uh, a particular society. But it's what Evans Pritchard never really did was he didn't give it much empirical support from any detailed case histories. And so what we don't see in Evans Pritchard's uh, model of lineage segmentation is where real, uh, the real lives of real people are. It's very much a model of real lives. And what I'm trying to do in this talk now is I'm going to in talk about uh, lineage uh, fission and fusion in a matrilineal society where women are the principal political actors, or at least for some kinds of politics they are. And I'm going to be looking at, uh, through the examination of a number of case histories of that kind of uh, principles of lineage fusion and fission in a matrilineal sense. Um, there's a picture of what one typically finds in a mosquito community when you go to, this is a community called uh, Kara, which I've been to a few couple of times. And uh, these are women from Kara. This, all these women represent the members of one uh, matrilineage. Um, so uh, these are women who are allies and um, uh, would uh, constitute a member, if you like, of a single group. They're all descendants of an apical ancestress. So, okay, first of all, now I want to switch now. That's the theory done. And I want to get onto probably kind of what might be more uh, enjoyable, which is a, a short history for next of the Mosquito people. And the Mosquito are, uh, present day Mosquito are uh, descendants of Amerindian peoples, uh, Misumalp speaking Misumalpan languages, uh, who had early contacts with Europeans from the um, uh, early um, 17th century. Um, uh, to the present, they were in contact first with buccaneers, the buccaneers who um, attacked the uh, Spanish uh, uh, ships, they would hide amongst the mosquito. Uh, there were no deep water ports there, so the Spanish uh, and inhospitable jungles and even less uh, hospitable people. So the buccaneers were able to establish alliances with the mosquito and the whole uh, mosquito area, which is the shaded area of, uh, on that map of Central America, it became, in the, if you like, uh, uh, an area, a no-go area for the Spanish. The Spanish never settled it. And the Mosquito, um, uh, armed by the Buccaneers uh, uh, through trading, uh, became um, greatly feared and um, extended from their original uh, area in Cap Cape Gracias, so Dios and Sandy Bay, which you see on the map, and came to occupy the, that whole shaded area. Um, later on, uh, the Buccaneers became... Uh, uh, after the buccaneers that were largely english-speaking people called who came to be known as shoremen who were settlers some of whom uh, planted uh, some of whom extracted natural resources and um, some shoremen were um, uh, uh, escaped or freed slaves from other parts of the english-speaking uh, caribbean who set up little communities amongst the mosquito and so on um, and from the mid 19th century that you had uh, companies coming to the mosquito coast which uh, by that time was formerly a part of uh, Nicaragua, but it, the, the Nicaraguan state was never able to really, uh, at that time, wasn't able to uh, induce settlers to go there. So it was essentially beyond uh, the control or purview of the nation state. And what you found is that um, uh, companies from English speaking from North America and Britain uh, came to exploit rubber, mahogany, bananas, minerals, um, marine resources and so on. And um, to some extent, this is still uh, the same. At Th that time, um, the Mosquito Coast was still, a, a, if you like, an unofficial and informal protectorate of the United Kingdom. The, uh, the United Kingdom recognized a Mosquito King, um, uh, didn't recognize Nicaraguan occupancy of that area. But in the reincorporation of 1894, uh, the British agreed to, uh, if you like, uh, withdraw from the area and um, it became a properly uh, Nicaraguan um, territory, the Mosquito Coast, or oh, well, part of the Honduras territory afterwards as well. Um, then afterwards, uh, you had um, this was a regarded uh, Mosquito regarded this as a betrayal by the British, and although they're still very much Anglo Anglophile, but um, they uh, uh, many of them look uh, wistfully back to the days of when there was a Mosquito Kingdom that was supported by the British. Um, the mesquite in um, the, uh, the companies, the rubber, mahogany, banana companies, continued into the mid-20th um, uh, uh, century. 
um, after the Sandinista revolution, um, the Sandinistas didn't know what really to do with this strange part of the country that they found in eastern Nicaragua and um, they handled um, the mosquito question very, very badly and the mosquito were um, induced um, to join the Contras in an insurgency against the Sandinistas that was fought to a standoff and finished until about 1988. Uh, there was a negotiated peace between mosquito insurgents and other insurgents and the uh, uh, Sandinista government. Um, today, the mosquito uh, are really involved still, as they always were, in the exploitation of um, uh, a number of marine resources. So they catch shrimp, uh, sorry, um, coastal mosquito catch uh, fish with gill nets, which they sell for cash nowadays and have done in the last 30 years while I've been there. Also, uh, seasonally, they catch um, shrimp, which they also sell. Um, sometimes at certain uh, times of the, uh, the year, they catch turtle, which come down the Caribbean from uh, further north, head on their way to um, uh, lay their eggs in Panama, uh, sorry, Costa Rica, and the mosquito catch turtle. And also perhaps more, most importantly of all, that they um, grow cassava and other um, uh, cultigens, ban uh, bananas, plantains, uh, dry rice, uh, yams, yampi, and so on. Um, in um, slasher burn farms. In other words, this is um, Swidden horticulture. Um, since uh, in more recent years that uh, mosquito uh, speaking people have come to become involved in um, other um, areas. So they now uh, catch lobster, which is extremely lucrative. They sell that for cash. Uh, um, where I work in Cacabilla, the lobster is not particularly important. So there's not much lobster in that particular part, but Many of the people speak Caribbean English as well as mosquito because of connections with Jamaica and the Caymans and so forth. So many uh, mosquito go to work uh, on uh, cruise ships and southern mosquito go to work as menials. Um, and also the cocaine trade to the mosquito coast has become a route for which the cocaine trade uh, travels north from Colombia up the Central American Caribbean coast to North America. That's become a more important route for the shipping of cocaine. Right, um, mosquito um, represents uh, their own body, put it, in terms of a mother scorpion. Um, so mother scorpion is, if you like, the ancestress of the mosquito. This is how old time mosquito represented themselves as the descendants of mother scorpion, which is a female figure with uh, lots and hundreds of breasts. And uh, mosquito, mother scorpion represents uh, the, the past the present and the future, and in some sense it's an embodiment of the mosquito uh, body politic. And um, I'd like to think that this represents the uh, mother scorpion, uh, the mosquito kind of intuition that, that their society is a matrilineal one. Uh, and um, we already know from those of you who uh, uh, come to write a lot, who, or anthropologists who know about Durkheim, and that what Durkheim argued is that social structure is often in, through ritual and myth is celestialized. In other words, uh, that the gods and the heavens in some sense represent social structure. So Mother Scorpion does this very nicely that she's, if you like, uh, 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 um, I don't know if deity is too strong a word, but she's a celestial representation of the mosquito body uh, politic. And this very much captures the idea of uh, mosquito uh, matrilineal. So, um, and this is very much uh, like uh, origin myths that one finds for the foundations of uh, mosquito villages. So, for example, uh, both Asang, uh, where Mary Helms famously worked, a mosquito village, and Pacavilla, uh, where I worked, that you find that mosquito, uh, the, the origins of myths of those villages, that they were founded by groups of sisters. You have this group of sisters who, in a sense, are the ancestresses of all the people who live in the village now. And all the people of the village are, if you like, from one nibble, the Tiala Katmabumi winner. They're from one nibble. So the Mosquito Coast, that's just to give you an idea that it is actually a very remote place still, that you don't get what uh, Mosquito still called Spaniards, or which are Spanish-speaking Nicaraguans. Uh, you don't get uh, Spanish spoken very much in that area. And um, this area is still very remote. It's a lot of it is jungle or um, savanna. So you get uh, jaguars, as you see here, tapirs, um, peck wild uh, droves of peccary, monkeys, all kinds of things um, out in the bush, and uh, and so on. Um, Cacabilla uh, is the community where I worked in, 
is um, uh, on the Pearl Lagoon Basin, so it's uh, what one finds on the Mosquito Coast is a lot of these uh, estuaries which are almost enclosed by these uh, peninsulas. So you see here, this is the Pearl Lagoon, which is the um, shaded area or the uh, hatched area. And uh, Kakabila is a mosquito village. When I first did field work in it, it was quite small, about 280 people. Now it's about a little more than a thousand people. And there that squid and horticulture slash and burn farming of mainly cassava, but also other cultigens is uh, most important for subsistence, but for cash that people will uh, hunt, uh, uh, will go gill net fishing, uh, catch shrimp, and also hunt turtle, which they also consume all those things, but they also uh, get cash from all of those. There's also some kind of hunting out in uh, the bush as well, and quite a lot of gathering. More recently, what one finds is uh, that he finds uh, that cruise ship work, uh, the mosquito are making, some people are making fine uh, money through cocaine. Because out in the Pearl Keys and other areas along the coast, the Colombians uh, send fast speed boats um, out uh, taking cocaine up to North America, often when they're pursued by the Nicaraguan uh, Navy or the US Coast Guard, they throw their cargo over to make their boats go faster and get rid of the evidence. And surprisingly often these wash up on the Keys or on the coast. Mosquito fishermen find these and uh, this is a, a, another important, with some have become a, a, an important uh, addition to the economy. By no means everyone finds them, but people surprised find them surprisingly often and I know people have found them cocaine two or three times at, at sea. So uh, Kabila uh, is inflected by what I call the politics of intimacy and um, what one finds is matrilocality, so in other words grooms go to live with their um, uh, uh, their brides and their brides parents, so that's matrilocal, that's what that means, so men move outside, they're strangers, if you like, not always strangers, but they're outsiders in their bride's families, and they legitimate their uh, uh, conjugal unions or marriages through the principle of what anthropologists call bride service, which means working for your uh, in-laws. You work for your affines or in-laws, anthropologists call in-laws affines, but it's the same thing. So you work, uh, that's something which is terribly important. And so what is also an important principle for mosquito kinship is the sibling set, so you've got the set of sisters who are all, um, if you like, members of this group. They're, the, if you like, the mother scorpion of a particular group. And ideally, what they try and do is keep uh, 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 their brothers uh, with them if they can, or at least maybe the brothers have moved out, but keep them on side. Whereas, uh, and they see their sisters-in-law who are members of these other little mother scorpion groups, if you like, as uh, pulling their brothers away from them. So the, um, the success of one of these groups is depending on how you can keep the sibling set um, together, if you like. So this is um, something which is the, what I've called in some of my work, the Confederacy of Sisters, the group of sisters who, um, if you like, for, are a political corporate group and so on. What's interesting, though, for, male, uh, for males is that although that they feel that their sister's trying to pull them back, but quite often what they find is that they um, have to construct um, their um, political relations with other males, particularly their brothers-in-law, with their fathers-in-law or sons-in-law and so forth. So male relations are dyadic. In other words, they're one-to-one. -one. So males will be imagining their relations with a a particular brother-in-law with their father-in-law or if they're el older perhaps with a son-in-law and so on so you've got male have a number of different dyadic relations with other individual males whereas women's imagine their relations as being part of these groups of classificatory sisters which are not just sisters but also maybe mother uh, mother sisters mother sisters daughters they're all groups uh, uh, women who are naturally nearly related to one another you can see the cow that this uh, works through nicely through this picture that how these women are kind of, if you like, uh, quite powerful. This is um, an older woman's um, funeral in Karawala, which is quite like Kakabila. And this is Miss Santa at her funeral. 
that her sisters insisted that all the sons-in-law are gathered together and a photograph are taken of them. And this photograph illustrates uh, Miss Santa's, how she was able to kind of, if you like, exercise over four sons-in-law. And this is uh, captured very nicely in this photograph. So uh, this is, a, a, if you like, a culture of groom capture where uh, the, the female scorpion uh, captures and stings into submission their son-in-law um, prey, if you like. So this is uh, Miss Santa's prey during her lifetime. And still, even after her death, they're still, if you like, um, subdued and, um, uh, and so on. So um, what one finds then in uh, communities like Kakabilla, mosquito communities like Kakabilla, is that the member of the sibling set is a uh, classificator of this sister's in law. What that means simply is that it's not just the sisters themselves that are part of that group, but also people who may be um, the mother, the mother's sister, uh, the mother's sister's daughters, because they're all descended uh, through the mother's line in common, that they are, if you like, part of that sibling set. So the sibling is something, uh, uh, not just uterine sisters, but is a larger group. So this might be uh, beyond the uterine sibling set to perhaps matrimonially related um, cousins uh, and so on. So one finds this, uh, I talked about this in relation to baseball in another paper, I won't go into that here. And also it's ritualized through Kitty Alley, which is a form of con ritualized conflict between men and women, which again, I won't talk about here. Um, and so this is, um, is uh, 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 how these groups actually are constructed. Now, I want to look at some of the uh, principles by which these groups, um, if you like, imagine uh, their cohesiveness and also how these groups somehow um, uh, uh, are that cohesiveness is threatened through the principles of uh, fission and fusion. Sorry, one of those is meant to be fission. And this is some uh, case histories from Cacavilla. And uh, uh, one of them is uh, about uh, the responsibilities of care. And this involves uh, Bula, Louisa and Marina going to talk about that. Then I'm going to talk about um, the war between two parts of the village in 1992, Uptown and Middletown. The Cacabilla is divided into three barrios or uh, neighbourhoods, Uptown, Middletown and Downtown. I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, if you like, elopement, banishment and um, bride surface and how that inflect is inflected by, um, if you like, uh, mother scorpion politics, we might call them. I'm going to talk um, about uh, Miss Leoncia, who was the head of one of these groups, and her ritualized hysteria, uh, which is related to relations with her son-in-law, Playa Cat. I'm going to talk about um, how uh, uh, cocaine and the disappearance of uh, Miss Marga's group, which is another similarly constituted group. And then I'm going to talk right about um, a woman I knew called Miss Violet, her death, and the gradual uh, segmentation of her daughter's set. So um, this is what I'm going to uh, be talking about um, now. By the way, in this photo, you can see um, a, a classic example of a male dyadic relationship, a father-in-law and a son-in-law who are mutually called Dapna to one another, son-in-law and father-in-law Dapna, and here they're producing, processing sea bog sea shrimps, uh, which are then going to be sold. So you can see this is a classic example of how male politics work in that their relations of two individuals to one another. Right, so I'm going to start with um, Kuka Libya's set. Um, and you can see here that the apical ancestor who was dead even before I got to Pacabilla is, is Missy. And she had uh, two daughters and they're not joined because they were by different fathers. Uh, Libius's father was a Chinese trader who came to Pacabilla and Violets was a man, mosquito man from another com community. And I'm interested here in, uh, I'm going to talk about Violet's set later, but Libius is here. And one of the things that was interesting is that how uh, the pressures of um, uh, um, matrilineal descent and what I'm calling here uh, mother scorpion politics is that uh, when um, uh, uh, Beulah was a young girl that Libius um, gave her her younger sister Loisa to help her raise her children. So Loisa who's here, who's a daughter for Libius, uh, sorry, whoops, um, uh, yes, that um, she took one of her daughters to help Beulah when Beulah was starting her own um, uh, 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 um, group. 
Now, the problem was that that was fine, that Louisa was very helpful to Beulah, but the problem was that then um, when uh, Beulah tried to get Marina to come and help, uh, 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 that Louisa tried to get Marina to come and help her in her turn, that Marina wouldn't come. So this is an example of um, the kinds of obligation which are, if you like, uh, hoisted on uh, young Pacabilla women uh, by older Pacabilla women that they are expected to um, uh, uh, be engaged in relations of care. So that's just an example from Puka Livius's uh, group. Now, this is something which is uh, more complicated and not complicated, but is uh, a longer story. And this is um, a Kukaroki's set. Now, Kukaroki um, had uh, two daughters um, uh, by different uh, fathers, uh, Leoncia and Angelia. And Angelia had um, a number of daughters here, uh, uh, and um, and also a son, Kidasku. Uh, what was interesting is that Kidasku was able to. He was quite. He's quite a tyrant, and he's able to. Um, although uh, he, as a son, would be expected to marry out, and he married uh, Lucilla, that he was able to bring Lucilla and their daughters into this group. This group were known as the Middletown people, and so um, Lucilla and her children belonged technically to a, another matrilineage but Kidasku through his strength of personality and being quite frankly rather a bully was able to build, bring his wife and his daughters into this particular um, set. Um, uh, an example of how uh, this mother scorpion politics works is that uh, I remember uh, on one um, occasion that uh, Chavi lived in a little house which was close to the other houses in Middletown where the rest of this set lived with her uh, partner, who was a man called Tehran. And at one time, uh, Chappy and her husband and their child, they, they left their house and left Alicia, who is the one, uh, like the younger sister, Chappy's younger sister here, where the cursor is, in charge. Um, now, what happened was that a man from another part of the village, um, Quasku, that he had brought a friend from a northern mosquito village and this northern uh, mosquito liked the look of Alicia and heard that she would be there in the house by herself and thought, well, let's go. And um, Alicia liked this uh, northern mosquito young fellow and they arranged to meet at Chavi's house because Chavi was away. So it was like uh, big sister's house is empty. Let's uh, go and hook up there. The problem was, though, that um, Chavi uh, came back unexpectedly and she found Alicia um, Courting, if you like, to use the euphemism with this up the coast, this uh, northern mosquito man, and Quasco was there as the contact who introduced. And Chappie um, let fly at Quasco and uh, started thumping him up and hitting him. And then Danto, the sister, came and joined her, and so on. And so uh, there was a fight, a fist fight between Chappie and Danto on the one hand, and Quasco on the other. The next day, the northern mosquito man thought, well, I'm out of this, and he left. But um, what happened uh, a, a few days later was that um, that uh, Quasco was seen at the, on the baseball field um, uh, and uh, Chaffee and her group decided that they were going to teach him a lesson. So Chaffee got her mother, Angelia, her grandmother, Rocky, uh, Danto and Alicia. Uh, the five of them uh, headed after Quasco, who was on the ball field, all carrying large clubs at the start. And they started thumping up Quasco. Uh, uh, Quite, quite badly, but Quasco was able to grab one of Chavi's one and hit Chavi over the head and concussed her. And after that, um, there was a, a, a big uh, fuss that people started rustling around and everything. And um, Cadasco came on the field and wanted to uh, attack Quasco and so forth, but Quasco's brother was there. And there was this war between um, uh, downtown, sorry, between Middletown, where Kukaroki set were, and uptown where Quasco and his brother Negro uh, lived, and brother Negro was bringing in all his uh, people as well. So what I think this uh, kind of uh, shows is that how uh, the um, uh, matrilineally related women can organize themselves very quickly and effectively, that Chavi had got uh, Danto, Alicia, uh, Angelia and Rocky um, on side to uh, launch an attack on uh, this fellow Quasco, who uh, they saw as uh, bringing someone to have an illicit uh, assignation with their, uh, their kinswoman, Alicia. So this is an example of, uh, if you like, a descent, descent group fusion, where groups, um, if you like, uh, come together. 
So um, that's another example. Another example is uh, from um, my fieldwork in 92. Is, uh, this is Miss uh, Kruka Chivella's uh, set. And here you have uh, Chivella uh, uh, had a, a number of daughters. Um, and those are all the grey circles there underneath her. And um, her daughter, her uh, oldest daughter was Lorna. And um, Lorna had um, a daughter who was in her late teens called Annette. So Annette, um, uh, one time Annette, uh, when she was a young woman, had very stupidly, according to Lorna, had uh, eloped with Carlito uptown. The, the Miss Kuka uh, Chavela set all lived downtown. So um, Annette had eloped with Carlito and gone to stay with Carlito's uh, parents. But um, this hadn't worked out well that uh, away from um, Lorna, his mother-in-law, that Carlito was able to uh, beat up Annette sometimes when he didn't like what she was doing. And also on top of that, that uh, Carlito's um, own uh, kinswomen, uh, which are here, you see here's Carlito, he's grey now, and all of these women who are his maternal aunts, uh, Grace, Eva, Mary, uh, Swine and so forth, they didn't treat Annette very well at all. So um, Annette um, came, ran back to her mother's Lorna and uh, Lorna um, forgave her, Annette, and said, OK, but um, if you're going to make anything of this uh, marriage, Carlito is going to come and have to live with us. So um, Carlito agreed and he came to live with Annette and so on. And things were quite rocky and that Carlito occasionally would go home, would run home if when he had a dispute with his mother-in-law and so on. So things were not uh, very easy. Anyway, on, on one particular occasion, um, Annette um, uh, got pregnant for her third child by Carlito. And following the birth of the third child, the, uh, a few days later, um, that um, Lorna, who was sitting um, at a neighbor's veranda, Tilash, Annette's sister, came running back to Lorna and said, Mum, mother, mum, mother, mother, come quickly. Uh, Carlito's beating up Annette. And um, this, remember, Annette has only had a baby uh, a couple of days, a few days before, about seven or eight days before. And so Lorna came rushing back and demanded, said, what the hell's going on, you know, to Carlito? And Carlito said, well, um, what happened was that she took the baby outside of the veranda, outside of the house, onto the, onto the veranda. And what that meant was that for Mosquito, that if you, uh, a woman who's given birth to a baby, that the, the woman and the baby are supposed to stay in the house for nine days to observe a postpartum taboo about going out. Annette had brought the baby out and therefore had risked um, a spiritual attack. Carlito said he couldn't afford medicine if uh, Annette or the baby got sick and therefore he was trying to knock some sense into her by banging her head against the house wall, as he uh, put it. And Lorna was furious and um, she threw Carlito out and uh, Carlino, Carlito had to go back to his own family uptown at the other end of the village and Annette stayed with the babies, except Carlito was able to take one of the babies, Jessica, with him. So um, uh, uh, this is, uh, so Carlito was, if you like, exiled. Anyway, Carlito kept trying to make uh, things good again and, uh, but uh, Lorna uh, wasn't having it um, and um, she, as mother-in-law, she refused uh, to countenance Carlito coming back. Anyway, um, Christmas holiday came and a number of um, uh, 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 Lorna's sisters, who are specifically Sofa, Gloria and Fidelia, who are Lorna's sisters, in other words, uh, Annette's maternal aunts, all came to Cacabilla for the Christmas season. And what happened was that uh, 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 they decided they were going to get uh, Annette away from Carlito. And what they did was um, that while Carlito was hunting turtle at sea, um, that uh, they whisked um, Annette off uh, with Ahsoka Gloria and Fidelia to Managua. They also took um, Telia and Michaela there because they thought that those two young girls, Telia and Michaela, and also Annette, would uh, learn uh, a little bit more about life in Managua. They'd learn Spanish, they'd learn um, Spanish ways and so forth. And at the same time, you get Annette out of the way of Carlito. So um, Carlito was, if you like, um, became a, a social adolescence again, because if you don't have a spouse in the mosquito community or in bride service communities, generally you become a social adolescent. Well, um, in time that Carlito sort of begged, uh, kept begging uh, Palfred, uh, in other words, Annette's father, because his relations had deteriorated so much with his mother-in-law, who started asking his father-in-law, when is Annette coming back? And in the end, 
uh, Palput and then Lorna relented, Carlito was allowed to stay with them, and um, he started building his own house because he'd lived, uh, Lorna and Palput and Etan, Carlito lived with them, he started building his own house next to them. And this caused quite a fuss because um, uh, people had said, well, um, uh, uh, this caused quite a fuss because uh, Carlito had announced during one of his rows with Lorna that he would never build his house next to hers. And so this, his capitulation on this was, uh, was an instance of um, how the mother-in-law has more power over the son-in-law, as uh, one of Lorna's sisters said, uh, cow power, but he said women have more power. And this is the example that she used of Carlito. So um, uh, that was really what happened. But in the end, um, Carlito started slipping back into uh, bad ways in uh, drinking rum and things like that and um, the house was never actually built that became a climbing frame for the uh, uh, children of um, Rupert Javela's set. So this is an example of how, um, uh, 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 of, if you like, descent group fusion, because you have uh, Tilash and Annette uh, working with uh, Lorna to um, highlight uh, Carlito's attacks, and then you've got uh, Lorna and all her sisters uh, plotting and successfully spiriting Annette away from Carlito. So this is an example of, uh, if you like, a mother scorpion in action. Um, uh, this is, again, just a picture of really Carlito's own set. And one of the problems when, uh, in the early days of their relationship, when Annette was staying with Carlito, was um, bullying by uh, Carlito's um, uh, uh, maternal aunts uh, on Annette. So Annette was, if you like, the outsider in this group. She's the red circle, so she's the outside women. And um, this is why um, a patrilocality is very uncomfortable in uh, matrilineal type societies like uh, this group too. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, Leoncia's set. Um, that here we have the interesting one here, I think, is the story of um, Sandra and Flyercat. And uh, Flyercat. Um, was a young son-in-law. He was from a northern mosquito uh, town called uh, Puerto Cabeza, and um, he was lived with Sandra um, in uh, uh, the houses of uh, in the house of his mother-in-law Leoncia, Leoncia and father-in-law Melado. So he lived. Uh, Flyercat lived with his parents-in-law, but um, uh, he was. Uh, often rowed with his mother-in-law, Leoncia, and when this would happen, that she would have uh, these kind of uh, greasy fits attacks, attacks of in mosquito called uh, hysteria, which are called known as greasy sickness. So Leoncia would have these fits of hysteria after she had these rows of fly with flyer cat. And this may be to do with the fact that the mother-in-law, son-in-law relationship is considered extremely important and it's considered very important that it should be conducted respectfully um, which, as we saw in the last case with uh, 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 Lorna and um, uh, uh, Carlito, is not always the case. Um, what happened that uh, finally that this blew up out of control when um, Flyercat, who had never beaten Sandra before, started uh, beating up Sandra, and then Leoncia um, attacked him, and Milado threatened him, uh, Flyercat, with a bow and arrow, and so on. And um, Flyercat had to leave, and he went. Um, to another part of the village for a while and so on and um, uh, 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 until um, that was resolved and eventually it wasn't resolved for a while because he went to live um, in, uh, in Pearl Lagoon and eventually Sandra actually joined him in Pearl Lagoon. They lived with their sister Marta who lived in Pearl Lagoon and um, Sandra and Flyercat eventually um, came back um, to live with Miss Leoncia's set. But Sandra was never really after that. The, the other sisters uh, regarded her as a bit of a liability and they didn't quite um, trust her in terms of their uh, uh, sisterly sort of um, planning, if you like, or, uh, uh, and so on. So Flycat um, uh, 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 came back with his tails between his legs. They came back to Cacavilla, but um, they weren't really kind of ever uh, uh, regarded as entirely trustworthy by um, Sandra's uh, sisters. Um, um, Plycat, the reason that he'd been beating Sandra, it is said, was some people said it was because she refused to cook for him when he brought back things from the hunt. On other other people said that Plycat was having sex with Nora, which was Sandra's uh, younger sister. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but these are some of the reasons given for 
fly a cat's um, uh, attack on Sandra but, uh, and so on. The term, for those of us who are interested in sex strike, the name fly cat itself is interesting because at one point that uh, Sandra kept um, refusing to give fly a cat uh, sex and um, the reason was, the presenting reason at least, was that the bed was too hard and fly a cat kept saying, well, let's go and do it on the beach. So he kept on saying, uh, to the beach, to the beach, fly a cat, fly a cat. And Cacabilla people being teasers, if, if anything, uh, gave him the nickname of fly a cat. And of course, uh, that kind of stuck. So uh, this is an example, again, of, um, uh, 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 of uh, the group, um, of, in some group, of the uh, matrilineal descent group uh, cohesion or uh, fusion, but in some sense there's also a little bit of uh, fission in there that, in that Sandra is no longer really um, regarded with quite as much trust as she was beforehand. Um, another case which is interesting in this group is also the case of uh, Miss Marga's set. If you look towards the left hand side, Marga and Mario, um, that they've got here, they've got a number of children, but the ones I'm interested here are Erica, Daniel, and uh, Leonora. And um, Marga, after uh, Mario's death, um, that she went up to live in uh, Puerto Cabeza, which is a town much further north. And on one occasion that um, Erica, uh, Daniel, Leonora, and Erica's uh, spouse, Tikuta, and their daughter, Daniela, that, that all of them, who are part of, if you like, this um, minimal matro lineage within the larger matro lineage, decide that they're going up to Puerto Cabeza to visit Marga. Now, what happened was that they disappeared and no one could find them for a month. People were trying on mobile phones because this only happened this year and no one could get through to them uh, on a mobile phone and people were terribly worried. And then people began to speculate that what Eric and uh, Daniel and Leonora were doing, and Leonora was heavily pregnant as well, was that, that they were taking cocaine that um, Doki, had, uh, who was also in their matrilineage, on the, if you look there, there there's Doki to the, towards the bottom on towards the right, that he was involved in cocaine smuggling and that he'd given them uh, some cocaine to take up to Puerto Cabeza uh, with them. And so uh, they argued that this is what Doki was doing. In fact, um, uh, about after a month of their disappearance, they actually turned up out of the blue. And what had happened was that they hadn't actually gone anywhere, but it had been speculation that they'd been uh, kidnapped or uh, murdered or arrested or any combination of those. In fact, what had happened was that Leonora, a heart halfway, that her labor pains had kind of, uh, uh, kicked in and uh, they'd had to stop and where they were, there was no mobile phone signal and everything. So everything was all right. But what was interesting about that is the speculation of um, that uh, Erica, Daniel and Leonora um, might have been willing to do that for Doki and so on. So this is, um, uh, represents, if you like, uh, um, some kind of um, potential for fusion for uh, Miss Loncia's set. Right, the last group I'm going to talk about now is Miss Violet's set. And this represents, I think, very much the kind of fission end of things, fission. Now, Missy, we've already looked at Libius's group who are descendants of Missy, um, but by um, the, her other daughter, uh, who is significant, is Violet. Um, Violet had uh, four children uh, by her first um, husband, Mr. Eddie, who figures here was a, a second husband. Um, it's not the father of the, the people here who are given as her children. Uh, Rachel, Fire, Lucilla and Andrew, three daughters and one son. Now, um, when Miss um, Violet died, um, that, uh, that uh, Rachel um, did seem to, was uh, very active in all the morning and a lot of people were saying that, that Lucilla and Andrew really didn't uh, contribute enough to the mortuary rituals in terms of their actions. They didn't perform the dirges, they didn't come to the graveside and try and ritually throw themselves into the grave as Rachel had done, that uh, they hadn't done it properly, as it were. As one Creole woman who was there said, well, Rachel did all the work kind of thing. So there was this kind of sense that really Rachel was taking on the body of uh, Violet's, uh, sorry, uh, taking on uh, charge of uh, Violet's group after Violet's uh, death, but none of the others were really kind of uh, adequately getting involved. And um, this happened uh, within a few months, there's more evidence of this, in that her widower, Mr. Eddie, had um, was uh, shown interest in another woman and that um, what happened was he took this woman, as you often 
uh, as men often do when they want a bit on the side to um, his provision ground where he planted his cassava and the Rachel was incensed because uh, this, this was a provision ground Mr. Eddie had made for Violet. So, you know, as the household that Mr. Eddie is supposed to, it's, you know, if Mr. Eddie is going to take another woman, it should be a, a no uh, earlier than a year afterwards. This is a, a very much a Cacabilla idea that if you take someone after the death of your spouse, it shouldn't be for another year because they shouldn't be able to use the provision ground you made for your um, deceased spouse sort of thing or help to make for them. So uh, Rachel was very angry about this and she approached Mr. Eddie in a, she, as she said, a respectful way, but she was terribly upset about this. You know, when I spoke to her about it and I heard her speaking to others and she was very upset um, in particular with um, Andrew, who she thought of, could have been more supportive. But Andrew said, oh, what the hell, you know, mama's dead and, and so on, Mr. Eddie, you know, but uh, Rachel said to Andrew, which, because Mr. Eddie was then living in Andrew's house at that point, she thought that Andrew didn't want to make any problems. So Rachel was really rather upset that Andrew hadn't pulled her weight on that as well as, as the morning. And um, then um, Andrew, Rachel also had fallen out with fire in that fire had um, uh, had uh, had gone to work with Aceto, um, who is Rachel's son, on the understanding that they would um, uh, be paid together and split the pay on some job that they managed to find. The problem was that uh, um, though that um, Fire got the money and never paid Cito, so Rachel was furious and um, she had a bit of a row with Fire and that got into a dispute with Trisu, uh, Fire's wife, and Rachel and Trisu had a, a huge, had huge, several huge shout ups where uh, Rachel accused um, Teresa of being a thief and Teresa accused Rachel of having an arse like a watchboard because she kept having sex with strange men on the beach and all this kind of thing. And then there was uh, one of Rachel's daughter, who's one of the plus four, uh, Dina was rowing with uh, Teresa and Teresa said to Dina um, that, um, uh, that she was getting, because she was giving sex to some man who had a lot of cassava, that she was getting free cassava for her group. Uh, through this and so on and so there's a lot of bad feeling so Rachel had fallen out with fire and she was already um, relations were cool with uh, Andrew at the same time the relations were never good um, never easy with Lucilla because although she uh, liked Lucilla Lucilla as a sister that we've already seen that Kadasco uh, uh, was really controlled her and that uh, Kadasco really controlled Lucilla and Rachel was all, all, always having rows with Kadasco over 30 years. She'd been rowing Kadasco about him beating up Lucilla and all this kind of thing. And also their daughters, um, Lucilla's daughters, have often been known, has been known on occasion to fight with um, Rachel's daughters about this thing, often jealousy of them, uh, boys and things like that. So this is where this uh, matrilineage is really sort of fallen apart here uh, as well. And another evidence, of last evidence, last case, is that um, Andrew, there's further tension between Rachel and Andrew, when one of Rachel's, sorry, Andrew's daughters, Turtle, uh, who you see there, that um, because uh, Delcy, her sister, uh, was uh, married to a big time trafficker, Dean, who's not from Capital, he's from somewhere else, but he's got a lot of money, he done, moves a lot of cocaine, stolen engines and weapons around the area. And so Delcy's always got a lot of money and that money sometimes is trickled down to the other sisters. So Turtle is always very well uh, looked after in terms of uh, clothes and everything. And this is quite recently, Turtle posted on Facebook um, a post that's sort of laughing after other Acapella girls for dressing in rags and smelling like fish. And she particularly singled out Tutch, who is Rachel's granddaughter, as you can see there, Seatoke's daughter, um, uh, for always wearing the same red dress, for always wearing and, um, this is something. And Rachel was furious about this and she managed to ambush Turtle, threw her to the ground and gave her a good slapping up, apparently, from all accounts. So uh, Rachel, this is where Rachel has fall fallen out with fire, Lucilla, and Andrew, her three um, siblings of her group. So this is where you see these descent groups are, if, if you like, um, fission. And no doubt in time, or maybe they'll have the um, processes that, that their own descent groups will uh, have already become, if you like, more significant. But there's been this principle of fission um, between um, the descendants of uh, Miss Violet there. Okay. So now I just want to um, come out, 
coming to the end now, but um, lineage segmentation, in other words, how these segments of, um, is this, uh, this idea that it's an anthropologist construct, that people that Evans Pritchard's NUA, which looked at how the descent groups came together uh, through vision and fusion, uh, that segmentation, that it's an anthropologist construct. But I don't think this is true. And if we look at, uh, it's certainly a, not just an anthropologist construction, it's a mosquito abstraction as well in through the idea of the mother scorpion. So the mosquito have this idea of uh, the lineage entity. And through, if we look at really what happens on the ground, that we can see the principles of fission and fusion uh, uh, it, at work, as it were. The other uh, criticism of Evans Pritchard's was this model is ahistorical. It doesn't really tell you anything about uh, what's happening over time. I don't think that's true. And what I've shown you represents um, those case histories uh, over the course of uh, 29 years, not just uh, over one short period sort of thing. So lineage theory, um, it's the thing about segmentary lineage theories. It's never really been applied to matrilineal groups. And this is partly because uh, the matrilineal puzzle has produced means that um, if we assume that politics uh, is in the hands of men in matrilineal societies, as has been um, argued uni universally, then the matrilineal puzzle whereby um, mother's brother and sister's son, who, you know, descend, one is descended from the other matrilineally, that they are, in a sense, uh, one inherits from the other, that it, because of the prince, that, uh, the matrilineal descent inevitably separates them geographically from one another, uh, because of the principle that you marry out of your community or out of your group into another community, that matrilineage is a short-lived. So lineage theory hasn't really been adequately applied to matrilineal descent. However, if one looks at um, matrilineal um, uh, matriliney in groups uh, which um, where women's political pro processes are foregrounded, then it's quite possible to see that um, uh, that kind of descent, uh, where it is an important organizing principle, uh, where political processes are importantly in the hands of women, as I think is has, I've shown as the case for Pacabilla that one can see that um, the idea of lineage um, theory and the idea of lineage fission and fusion, what we call uh, segmentary lineage theory, might be applied if it's um, used sensitively in that kind of way. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Mark. That was absolutely amazing. I've, I don't think I've ever heard a talk on kinship theory <laughs> quite so um, lively, <laughs> so much resting on real, real, real details. All of life, all of life. I know, it reminds me of the need of the world, yes, all human life is there, it's uh, fantastic. Um, so, I mean, just I, uh, earlier this term, of course, I gave a talk um, called, um, I forget quite what the title was, something to do with conflicts and controversies over um, matriarchy. And of course, as you've said, um, Mark, if you just have the assumption that males have to have political power and only males can have solidarity. In other words, patriarchy is absolutely essential and necessary part of the way things are. Then, of course, matrilineal descent and even more matrilineal descent with matrilocal residents makes no sense. You have this puzzle because men you know, just can't get their act together, they can't have much solidarity because, of course, men are always being separated from their kin through matrilocal residents and the descent system. And that, but, it's, so it's, but it's just only if you have that assumption. If you just assume there cannot be any element of matriarchy anywhere, then matrilineal, matrilineal descent is what they call a puzzle. Um, and of course, the, the thing to do is what you've done, is actually go somewhere and find out how matrilineal descent works. And also, of course, maybe you know doesn't work. But when it works, what you're telling us is that the, the mother scorpion is a kind of matriarchal uh, you know, creature is, is alive and kicking. And, it, and I think you, you're telling us, um, Mark, correct me if I'm sort of over-interpreting, that you have a matriarchal society. If any, if any sex is, powerful, is more powerful than the other, it's the females who are more powerful than the males and have more solidarity insofar as the traditional structures are maintained. Obviously, insofar as the cash economy enters into it, <laughs> the rest of it, um, those structures break down. But you seem to me to be telling us that matriarchy 
works. I mean, obviously, it doesn't nothing works perfectly, and especially not nowadays. But make that, 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 that quite contrary to everything you started off with, the, the newer. But I mean, obviously, it's Levi Strauss and so many other people. Quite contrary to all those ridiculous assumptions, in my mind, um, it is not necessary that even when you've got matrilineal descent and matrilocal resonance, males must always rule. I mean, what on earth is all that about? <clears throat> yeah, no, I agree with that completely. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that entirely. I mean, in terms of whether the mosquito or pacabilla is um, matrilineal, um, there's one um, uh, caveat that one might put forward is that, um, and this is something that was raised by um, Barnes for patrilineal societies, that he criticised um, the use of the term uh, patriliny for um, uh, some of uh, um, groups that looked like patrilineal in Papua New Guinea, saying that, well, they look patri like a patrilineal societies, but there isn't a patrilineal ideology. There aren't um, uh, um, uh, patrilineal, uh, named patrilineal groups and so forth, which one becomes a member of. But what happens in New Guinea is that you just have, um, that it's just what people do, that people will, um, women will live in, in New Guinea, that men will live close to their fathers and so on, and their brothers and so forth. And that just falls out of not an ideology, but just the kind of practices that make sense in that particular context. And what he described that was, he called that um, not patriliny in the strictest sense. He called that something that looked a bit like patriliny because it wasn't um, reified in, by those particular groups in terms of named descent groups, but was rather worked out over a, a number of tendencies. He called it cumulative um, patrifiliation. Patrifiliation in that you uh, tend to relate to your father uh, as it was the case in his new unions, and cumulative in that there wasn't so much an ideology or something that named groups, but it was something that worked out over time. What I wondered was if what, what we're perhaps looking at here, if a cacabilla is something that might be described as cumulative matrifiliation, insofar as there aren't named descent groups, uh, uh, matrilineages. So arguably, some people might say, well, this is not properly matriline. And, you know, there's a case of saying that, but I think it's very clearly cumulative matrifiliation at the very least. And as I think um, we can see here, um, I, I, sh I should add also that um, if anyone's thinking that I've been selective in terms of the kind of ethnography, the kind of case histories that I've done, that I couldn't have got anything like that for looking at men's political processes in those terms, that the kind of case histories I've shown would have involved a dyadic relationships almost inevitably between men, between typically between affines, not always, but often between affines. These are the kind of the kind of uh, politics I've described for um, Pacabilla. Um, in Pacabilla could only be, those kind of things could only happen for women. Um, I wanted to ask about that the clearly is significant aspect of, of, kind of domestic violence, um, it, even given the uh, context of, of women having their kin back up. But what is your view on how much women are getting real protection for against domestic violence, against their, their husbands or boyfriends beating them up? Um, um, they don't do brothers of women get involved, or is it basically women folk? Is it uh, who are the protectors? Yeah, um, there, there, uh, uh, there, there, there is virtually no, although um, there is um, a, a, a magistrate's court and a police station at Pearl Lagoon, there is no um, effectively is non existent mm. for those kind of cases. Um, so it has to be really something within the community. There is a, fixta, a figure within the community who's known as the Wifta or Wes, um, which is Spanish, which is uh, really an arbiter that arbitrates um, disputes. But by and large, that these uh, that, um, women who um, are the victims of domestic violence um, really have to rely on um, their own kin. Um, to a considerable extent, you know, as, as I showed in the cases. Yeah. Often, I mean, like Carlito, as I said, used to um, uh, thump up a net in one of the mm -hmm. cases I'm talking, but us, after time, the, the mosquito women often are not really shrinking violets, as I think no. you've seen. And <laughs> the, 
many of them uh, mo uh, are able to uh, to stand up and uh, Annette started hitting back at Carlito. And when she did that, and this is the case for one or two other women, I was over there, that they, began, that they tended to stop, you know. So it's not, I don't say, think that's the ideal way for that to stop. They shouldn't have to come to that for that to stop. But in practice, what happens in the ground? And uh, it's often what happens. And I feel desperately sorry for people, someone like Lucilla, for example, who Pidasco's wife, who I talked about, who, you know, for years mm. has been the victim of Pidasco's violence, you know, against mm. her. And um, that is something which is kind of saddening, you know. But really, it's yeah. um, that what you need is, um, uh, uh, yeah. And also, yeah, anyway, I'll leave it to that, yeah. Quite answer the question, I don't think. Mark. I mean, how, to what extent can women rely on brothers to come to their support. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Are um, brothers? Or brothers, women? it's more often uh, because the brother-in-law, brother-in-law relationship is um, is a very mm -hmm. important one. Yeah. Brother-in-law, brother-in-law, in other aspects, particularly in the economy and working together. Mm -hmm. You see, I haven't been able to look at all of the inflections of uh, Agadilla politics, I haven't really looked at the male picture, that brothers are often reluctant um, to get involved, um, which yeah. is... Uh, and often, if they are able to get uh, male help, it's more likely to be from the father, like we see in when Playa Cat, right. one time he got violent with Sandra. And that was the first time Playa Cat got violent with her, and possibly the only time that, um, that uh, uh, Sandra's father, Milado, pulled out a bow and arrow um, yeah. on him and yeah. kind of threatened him, you know, to kill him, okay. basically, yeah. with a bow and arrow. And um, uh, so it, it's... You know, it's more likely to be fathers than um, brothers right. in law. As it, as it, okay. The brothers, in sense, okay. sense, are likely to help you. Yes, right. that makes sense. Uh, there would be somewhat, uh, there would be some comparability to the Hadza, probably on that, that um, women rely on their mothers mm -hmm. um, and probably fathers, but brothers not so much. I'll give you an example of one thing how it's interesting in that respect. In it asks a lot of questions. I'm still uh, figuring out why it happened, but I think it's related to exactly that question. Is that um, at one time that um, Mario and Marga, we've, we've talked about Marga, when her husband uh, Mario was alive, there was some big problem between them. And what Marga's brother Tistis did was that instead of um, having a fight with his brother in law, he just went into their kitchen and smashed up the kitchen. Basically, he smashed up what was essentially his own sister's property, but this was to punish his brother-in-law. This was to punish his brother-in-law. So he smashed up his um, sister's kitchen as a way to get onto his brother-in-law. Not effective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but that is... Um, I'm, I'm still so years later, like 29 years ago, still trying, to, yeah. trying to figure out how that might have worked. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But it would have been effective in the sense that um, that the husband would have had to replace the kitchen and everything in it. Yeah, yeah. That so that's what sense. he was trying to do. Possibly. You know, he right. it would have been right. Mario would have had to replace all that, and this is just his way of punishing okay. Mario. Yeah. I can see Denise. Are you going to ask a question, Denise? Yes, I'm just curious about um, Mother Scorpion. I mean, I wouldn't associate the Scorpion directly with this figure of many breasts, and I just wonder where milk figures in all of this as a kind of ancestral substance on the female side, um, and its relation with the Scorpion. Is lactating really much more important than the bloodline as such? What are men considered to contribute to, to babies? I mean, how do they think about the construction of the body? Oh, right. That's a very interesting question. Uh, in fact, um, miss, there aren't, miss, in Capabilla certainly, and I think perhaps in Mosquito generally, that there are not really very, um, there are not really very much in the way of discourses about the. Um, the constitution of the person in sort of physical terms, you know, that um, the diff and what's oh, sorry, let's turn this off. <laughs> the differences between um, uh, men and women are essentially regarded by Kakadilla people as essentially sociological, that men and women are essentially the same kind of person. 
And there's, a, in some respects, uh, what differentiates them is the fact that women uh, uh, rear babies and men go out to sea and get money. But these are differences that are uh, the, the Pacabilla people's understanding what might be called sociological terms rather than because men are somehow different in their substance to women. Men and women are essentially different, uh, essentially um, the same in, as uh, beings. And it's interesting in many respects, and I've written about this elsewhere, the difference between adults and children is in a sense a more profound difference for Kakabila people than the difference between men and women, which is, um, I think, quite interesting. But um, yeah, the, 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 the breasts, it's not so much um, that the breast is lactating, it's just the breast, I think, is for the mosquito, is a more a symbol of um, nurturance gener more generally than about sort of a way of transmitting milk as a kind of uh, substance in that sense. Um, because the, when one asks, you know, and of course being like all anthrop any anthropologist would you say, well, how are babies made? You know, the anthropologists are always interested, is it blown or blood or bone, or is it only um, that the womb is a sort of empty receptacle that the man's seed grows in, or is it that the, you know, uh, that the, um, the man just opens the way for the woman's female spirit to open in like the Trobrand Islanders. And so women are self, um, you know, impregnating sort of thing. That the, there aren't really developed discourses like that, about that at all. You know, that um, it's, you know, people say that, oh yeah, it's about blood. Men and women contribute blood. And sometimes they'll say if the man um, puts, is blood is man's blood is stronger it'll look more like the man or if it's a woman it'll look more like the woman and it's terribly bad luck if to look like your parent of the same sex and all of these things so there are kind of uh, ideas about that but in terms of what constitutes it's just the notion of blood is really and it's equal from men and women if you like so that kind of matrilineal descent i know the trograd islanders that would be very difference. I mean, this uh, matrilineal descent is also underwritten by an idea that, of um, uh, the transmission of body substance that makes you into the person. But from, certainly the Pacabilla mosquito, that's not the, really the case, that differences between men and women are essentially imagined in more sociological terms. Is, is there anything else you can say to answer the part of that question from Denise, which is, I mean, you know, why scorpion if a scorpion didn't even have any breasts? I mean, why, you know, is many breasted scorpion? Is there anything more you can tell us about that sort of paradox? Um, I, I well, the, 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 I kind of wonder if whether the scorpion kind of um, stings its final prey, in other words, the son-in-law or whatever it is, into submission and then consumes it. And I think that possibly that it might be something like that. You know, I think you know people like. Um, uh, Playa Cat and um, Carlito and um, even poor Quascu, who was the contact for um, uh, Alicia's uh, lover, that, you know, they were all, in a sense, have felt the sting of Mother Scorpion. Do they say that? Do they say no. that? No. Mother Scorpion is something which is really an idea that's, uh, um, that that particular image is disappearing. People aren't really talking about that. So what I'm doing is using a, 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 a a, a, um, a, a metaphor that um, Pacabila people, or an image that Pacabila people, that mosquito people generally um, at one time were more widely used and kind of using it to help interpret what I think is going on in Pacabila. Lots of people haven't said anything. There's a question in the chat asking about um, gender queerness. Um, are there um, examples of, of people who don't identify in heteronormative sense? So if you want to talk to that at all, Mark. Um, at one time uh, in Kakabila, when I was first there, that wasn't the case. And very sadly, um, the one who was quite clearly um, uh, didn't uh, subscribe to uh, that, uh, Anthony, who is um, a, a, a young homosexual. Um, he, very sadly, Cadasco was his father and um, bullied him mercilessly about that. And in the end, uh, Tony uh, took his own life. He hung himself. And that was, um, you know, one of, um, something that still fills me with kind of a, lo a lot of sadness. And, um, but 
now um, in more recent, uh, the last decade or two decades, that um, there have been more uh, people who have declared themselves as being homosexual in Krakowila and now um, they're not Pidasco's children and um, that they are um, um, sometimes teased, but uh, on the whole that they're treated, but almost universally, that in other respects, they're treated um, exactly like everyone else, you know. Mm. So um, this is not something uh, yeah. which it, it is, it's not by any means as big an issue as it is in um, other parts in, of Nicaragua, where um, only today I learned that a transgender man was uh, murdered uh, today, which is in La Prensa today. So, yeah, which is in Spanish-speaking Nicaragua. In um, Mosquito-speaking Nicaragua, it's uh, very different. And I've been to a number of mosquito communities where, um, you know, I've been introduced um, uh, to homosexual men by other uh, men or women, and um, that, that by and large, that uh, in almost all the communities I've been with, that it's been uh, uh, some uh, acceptance. So, yeah. Tom, were you going to say something? Yeah, um, thanks, Mark. Fascinating. Um, I was wondering about the, the ritual uh, that got brought up with it. There was a, a photograph of, was it Moscow, where they had some sort of masks? Oh, yeah, yeah. It looked yeah. like with the masks and uh, the, they were pulling or something. And then there was something that said about baseball and something else that uh, some other sport that sounded interesting too. Okay. I gave her, um, if I can answer the second part of your question first, the baseball actually gave a paper on that, which I think is probably available on um, uh, line for RAG. But basically, okay. the baseball, what I was in, interested in that paper was women's baseball. And because women's baseball uh, represents an arena where um, you have um, fusion and the whole village, all the village women come together as one to have a village a team and they play tournaments against other villages. And uh, what happens in those tournaments is that the other teams will come and they will try and um, defeat one another, supposedly, by sorcery and by stealing one another's <laughs> um, but, but I'll send And the other is um, Moscow is an interesting, that's a ritual. That happens once a year. And it's where young, typically young adolescent men try to reinvent themselves from, turn themselves from children into adults, um, ritually. Um, by putting on these masks and doing these dances whereby they present themselves as strangers to adults' houses. They move from house to house uh, doing this dance with a guitarist. And um, um, the idea is that they present themselves as um, adults to contract relations with people of those houses. And therefore, it's, if you like, willingness to perform bride service and also this idea of exogamy that you marry outside the group, but you marry and um, people, you go, you're the stranger that comes from outside to marry into another group. And at the same time, they carry these switches, these little sticks, which, of course, the children are very excited when Moscow's taking place. And they have these switches, the Moscow dancers, which they beat away the children because that's a way of distancing themselves from childhood, while they show that they can negotiate relations with the uh, adults who are the owners of the houses where they come to uh, perform this dance. If you email me, Tam, I know I think we've got each other's email through um, yeah. the other group. I can send you my published paper on Moscow as well. Lovely. Yes. Thanks. Please work. Yeah. Yeah. Will do. The other uh, ritual, which I think is interesting, is Kitty Alley, which is a bowling game that takes place once a year between the men and the women. And the women, um, all the women of the group wear something red for the day, and the, the, uh, the, the men wear something blue for the day. And they. Um, they have this ritual where they're bowling against each other and it's said that the women always win because the men get too drunk and uh, <laughs> therefore the men the women always win but i interpret that as in a way of being that in a sense that's um i said earlier my in cow power piece a woman has more power sort of thing you know yeah. and uh yeah so um and what happens when the men young men are bowling the older women who if you like say that say that to, they shout out taunts to the younger men telling them that they have to miss because if they don't miss their shots they won't let the young women dance with them uh, later that night because there's always a dance after the, uh, the pity alley bowling game you know which takes place over all day mm -hmm. 
Ian, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just wondering whether there's thinking about Mother Scorpion, uh, whether there is anything, are there any historical records or is there anything from neighbouring groups that might help sort of try and unpick that a bit more? Well, um, the Mother Scorpion, the reports of Mother Scorpion since the late 19th century, you know, the people have discussed um, the mosquito uh, notion of Mother Scorpion from the 19th century when the ethnography of the mosquitoes first started to be, you know, properly looked at, mainly by Moravian missionaries, but they first really were the providers for the report, first reports of um, Mother Scorpion, yeah. I mean, um, the neighbouring groups, I, I don't know of any similar uh, stories from neighbouring groups. I've done field work also with a people called the Ulwa, who also speak a related language to Mosquito. It's not that closely related, but, um, you know, but it's um, about related, closely related as English and French, but uh, in Amerindian languages, that's quite close. But they have a very similar, um, they're neighbours of the Mosquito. They, many of the Ulwa speak Mosquito, most of them do, in fact, at least in the area where I was, speak Mosquito. And, um, but um, I don't know that story for, for the Ulwa at all. And, and in the Moravian literature, that, that, ha, have you had a chance to, to go through that? Um, I've gone through a lot of it, yeah. Um, uh, and I, I think I've probably found as, as much, almost, no, I'm not saying everything, but I found pretty much, I, I suspect, what pretty much most of what is written about Mother Scorpion. Um, but mm -hmm. remember, the Moravians were interested in really discrediting this idea and um, uh, foisting onto the mosquito their particular uh, um, brand of Christianity and, um, uh, if you like, stripping the mosquito of these um, heathen um, delusions, as it were. If I can have another question. Um, Clearly, some of the fissions are occurring because of uh, sexual competition between sisters over men, or or is that um, right? Uh, is there is that a kind of a complete sort of taboo? No, no, or or does it just is it just kind of demographic that sometimes things happen on the ground? Um, what what's the kind of status of that that's very interesting um but um the uh on the whole well cacabilla people almost in, well, universally say that you know it should be um you shouldn't be sleeping with your um uh sister's husband sort of thing you know that that's you not to do that so this is the sort of um one woman one penis kind of thing but on the other hand in um uh one guy I know who lived in Kakabila, he said um, that uh, he was a Creole fellow and he said he lived in Kara. You know, the picture of all the mosquito women uh, towards the beginning, um, you know, the first picture of all the mosquito women were there. That's from Kara. And um, he said the reason he left Kara, was, the reason he left Kara was that he couldn't handle it, that he was expected to sleep with all the sisters of his wife. So Kara is a, um, a village which is interesting in that it's mosquito but it's quite inflected by um, uh, Ulwa ideas. It's a mixed sumo Ulwa. And I think for some of the Ulwa ideas where um, that, you know, you can, you have um, wives, which are all the, your wife's sisters are your wives. I think that that's something which is receding, but I still think it is in there a little bit amongst the Ulwa. And I think um, that Kara is a mixed mosquito Ulwa community, though, albeit mosquito speaking and so on. Traces of group marriage in that yeah, case. Uh, in Kara, certainly. Traces yeah. of group marriage. Yeah. And the, I imagine even where yeah. even where sisters sort of disapprove of you know of, of uh, uh, one another's having a relationship with their own husband, I, I imagine that sort of is it true is that sort of jurally it's it isn't actually a a taboo. It's not a taboo in the sense that incest would be if it's just a question of don't do it it's going to cause trouble and i'm just wondering whether that's that's true and i just i just just while answering that mark could you just clarify for people that 
you don't have weddings, you don't have exactly marriage, that, that, that forming a relationship is a sort of more or less affair, not a... Very sad. Affair. Yeah, this is, this is um, it's a style of marriage which anthropologists have, uh, well, marriage in inverted commas, but a style of uh, contracting unions, conjugal union, which anthropologists call bride service. And what that involves is, um, it's not like uh, bride wealth, where um, the bride, the groom's family gives a large uh, gift to the bride's family, and then there's a ritual the next day you're married, whereas the day before you weren't, and then you're married, or like with dowry, and again, one day you're not married, and then you have this ritual the next day you are. With bride service, it's uh, gradually, what happens in bride service is that men have to gradually insinuate themselves into the goodwill of their in-laws, typically their parents-in-laws and perhaps their, uh, their uh, wives, um, brothers and so forth. And through doing that, you just gradually uh, build up, if you like, some kind of capital of um, acceptance uh, from them. And that's how, uh, if you like, conjugal unions are established gradually as a process. They're not really like a, it's one day you're not married and then the next day you are. It's a process of um, negotiation always. And this is particular example of this, that the example was uh, with Carlito, the Carlito and Annette, but that's um, very much a case of um, that happening. Just, just on that first point, I was wondering about, I mean, there's a difference between, you know, sort of social disapproval of a relationship and its illegality in, in sort of you know, formal general terms. I, I imagine the kinship system makes these other, I mean, it makes these other husbands, if you like, of a group of sisters, sort of, sort of legal in a sort of sense. Is that right? But, but but on the other hand, it would just cause too much trouble, so don't do it. Is that? Am I right there? Yeah, it's pretty much. I think that's about it, Chris. Yeah. I mean, there are um, there is um, some um, men and women. To order after that we want to solidify or legalize for various reasons because obviously you know that Catabilla has relations with the Nicaraguan state of one kind or another so some men and women um, get um, uh, civil marriage you know to, it's often to protect property rights sometimes or and then also church marriage but church marriage in particular is regarded almost as a, as a pre-mortuary right <laughs> you know, it tends to happen quite late in life and it's to get good with dawan dawan is the mosquito word for god you know before you uh, you know that if you uh, uh, are christian in a sort of the mosquito sense of that and you're not married and you you know you might go to hell if you're not married so it's a pre-mortuary ritual it's not a you marriage can... in the you know the wedding in the pro in the uh, sense that we know it yeah. What a beautifully appropriate concept. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what young men and young women do, or even older men and older women, is they what they use the word take in the Creole English. They say we, they take, which means that they become a con an unmarried conjugal union. Is there a, is there a sense you were mentioning that they, they hunt turtles and, and there's still a little bit of hunting and gathering still take place? Is there a evidence that? To the extent that you still have hunting and gathering, the matrilocal, matrilineal, mother scorpion system works better, and where you get more farming and cash economics and, and cocaine, it's, it's falling apart. Yeah, I mean, it's falling apart um, for reasons I talked about in one of the other talks a bit. Um, uh, first of all, there is, if you regard turtle as hunting, and uh, we, we can certainly regard that as hunting, but then hunting is still very significant if we include hunting turtle but they also hunt occasionally deer and uh, peppers and other things but turtle is certainly a very important uh, part of um, and um, when a turtle is uh, 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 um, hunted that it's brought back and um, the crew will then choose one of their num their number will make his veranda available for be being butchered and sold um, uh, to um, people who come and are willing to pay cash for some turtle meat, but not everyone pays cash. If you've got um, a family there, you know, the first person who's going to show up is probably going to be your mother-in-law uh, with her um, uh, little bowl, um, you know, to, for some free turtle meat sort of thing. So it's always interesting that um, turtle, as I was writing very recently, only the other day, that um, Turtle meat distributions are a real barometer of uh, what social relations are like at any particular part of the village. And you were saying there's a lunar sort of symbolic component, is there, to the tur turtle 
hunting uh, or what the, the sense oh, of hunting, as far as I'm aware. Sorry, no. Sorry. Is that manatee, Luna? You mentioned something vaguely lunar connected with um, marine resources, I believe, at one point, Mark. Maybe I'm getting it wrong. I'll try and wrap my brains. Uh, I can't think of it at the moment, but I'll, I'll, I'll have a think. Mark, Mark, wasn't that about the manatee? Something connected to the moon? Uh, manatee. Oh, yeah, well, manatee is kind of quite interesting because uh, manatee is also the manatee is represents if you like communal unity sort of thing and the meat of the manatee um, like other kinds of meat which were always which you know may be sold or whatever something might be given something might be sold but manatee meat is always you know, certainly when i was first there it was never sold it's always distributed across the whole community right. and then the head is cut off uh, uh, the head the guts are given which are given to as uh, to the children because children are unsocial beings as it were um, but the meat is distributed and given to each household, except for the head. And then the head is cut off and uh, made into a soup in a big, take like oil drum, sort of cooked, boiled with cassava and so on. And the head, the meat of the head can only be eaten by those who are regarded as adults, who are socially adult. Almug. I would invite you, Mark, to check up with your own field notes, because I'm, I'm quite sure... That, I'll have a look, Chris. I'll have a look for you. The fact that and I, and I aren't imagining it, you did, you did find in your field. Yeah. I, I, I thought it was something about manatee on, on moonlight nights. Yeah, that's right. Moonlit nights, generally, yeah. Oh, well, there you are, then. Mm -hmm. You mustn't forget these things. They're, they're significant. Yeah. The moon gets forgotten so much, you know, and it just, you know, I don't know, there's all sorts of pressures to completely forget it, except when you're talking about romantic love. So really important to... <laughs> To um, sort of, you know, make sure that these things don't get erased from history if they're there, if they're if they're significant, you know. Anyway, that's just me, you know, with the moon and all that. I can see Denise smiling a bit here. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? <clears throat> well, if there's no one else, um, I th I think next. Shall we move just to discuss next week? Um, I have a strong feeling it's Camilla next week. Is that right, Camilla? It's, it's, it's you. It is, yes, yes. We'll get more moon next week. You'll be happy to know. Yeah. 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 Um, so I, I'm talking about two uh, sort of superstructure concepts from African hunter gatherers. So Ekila, belonging to Bayaka um, forest hunter gatherers and uh, Epime of the Hadza and comparing the two of them. So we'll see if, that, if there is a, a strong ground of comparison. Brilliant, yeah. But the moon will come into it. There'll be, yeah, be plenty of lunacy, let's hope, yes. Um, yeah. Um, okay, all right. Um, so um, is that it then? Shall we, um, shall we say goodbye to next week? Um, anyone with the last yeah, minute desperate need to thanks, say something? Thanks for riveting case studies um, and, and for really challenging all this uh, mat, you know matriliny mat, matriaffiliation being a problem I think it's uh, fantastic. Yep. Well thank you very much and thank you um, for everyone for listening and thank you um, for some very very uh, useful comments um, some of which um, make me think more about certain aspects of it and that's really 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 helpful you know. I mean, the, the, the whole point of doing these things for for me, or well, not the whole point, but part of it is really to get your feedback and uh, yeah. get your questions. Um, and because it's those questions that make me think about things that, um, you know, I... Uh, well, I, I, I'm just so pleased because, of course, one of the things is that kinship is supposed to be the fundamental discipline of social anthropology. And yet, because social anthropologists have got these absurd preconceptions about, you know, patriarchy, um, they found that their models just do not work, do not work, do not work. And what's happened, unfortunately, is you, you cannot find anyone who can teach kinship theory in nearly all the universities. It's, just, it's completely vanished. So the core discipline is gone. And I'm just so pleased, uh, Mark, that you are sticking with it and showing that it actually does make perfect sense and correlates with real life. If only you turn the stupid assumptions upside down. So marvellous, really, really brilliant stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think what it sort of my kind of sense was that um, I wanted to um, 
really try and uh, because I, I had I've written before about mosquito kinship in more general terms, but what I wanted to been trying to do is um, really bring it to life by showing how it actually works out by using kind of case histories and um, mm. showing well, you know, this is not just something an abstract idea. This is something that people do. This is, uh, yeah. you know, that kinship is something that people do. Okay, thanks ever so much. Brilliant, um, Mark. Fantastic. So, okay, I'm now going to close our meeting. Right. See you. Thank you. See you. Yep, see you next week. And see some of you um, at the book club. Um, bye. This is a, a, yeah, Friday. Yeah. Okay, bye, everybody.